Welcome to the show. It's Monday. We talk NASCAR on Mondays with our good friend Rod Mullins. And Rod, uh, outside of St. Louis yesterday, a lot of restarts, a lot of action going on, a long race with the red flags uh, and weather delays on a hot day just outside of uh, St. Louis. Uh, Kyle Busch with his third win of the season. Uh, what were some of, some of your takeaways uh, from the day in racing? Um, I think people better start shaking right now and shaking in their boots because if Kyle Busch and Richard Childress Racing really do get kicked in like they did in this race, like they have in the other two wins that they've had so far on the season, uh, Kyle Busch could be looking for himself a championship at the end of the season. They're already talking about it. Uh, the odds have vaulted suddenly. Uh, it's gone from, you know, it was astronomically out there, you know, given his first season with Richard Childress Racing. I think he, the last time I looked, he's now an eight to one favorite to maybe pull something off and be able to win the championship. And I think what amazes me so much about this win is that it went to overtime. There were so many stops, so many starts, restarts, and everything else going. The weather played an important part in it right there as they as they shut down for a little while. But to me, more than anything else, I think this was just something that Kyle Busch said, and he summed it up in, a, in pretty much this way. That was pretty awesome. And to sit on the pole, lead a lot of laps, have his guys do such a great job in the pits for him, it was a great win for Richard Childress Racing. Just win, baby. That's the way he said. And thanks to Team Chevy, and he appreciated their sponsor, too, for, for all of this. But I think there's an even bigger picture with this. Um, I think when I said that people should be shaking in their boots right now about Richard Childress Racing and Kyle Busch and this resurgence of this team, you know, I think this team has had it for a long time. They just needed a driver to be able to guide them in the direction they needed to go. And they haven't had a driver really in any kind of sense since Dale Earnhardt or Kevin Harvick at that point. And I think Richard Childress is uh, admitting now more than he ever has, you know, this relationship, even though Richard Childress punched Kyle Busch here several years ago in a little, in a little melee, um, he compares their relationship almost to a Richard Childress, Dale Earnhardt kind of relationship. So, you know, the sky's the limit for this team right now, I think, as they go on through the rest of the season. Yeah, maybe it's one of those things where you're not brothers until you've traded punches with each other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, another thing that Sands said about this win for Bush, he talked about this after the race yesterday. You know, his other two wins this year were Talladega and Auto Club Speedway in California. Mm -hmm. um, they had not been running well on the short track. So now he's got a win on a short track. Right. Um, you, you talked about quaking the boots. That's another reason, too, because if he gets if he gets things together there, he's going to be dangerous in the playoffs. Yeah. And I mean, they still haven't come to some of the other short tracks that, you know, on the return trip. We're not counting dirt at at the food city race, you know, the food city on uh, race on dirt. Uh, it's a little bit of a different situation, but I'm sure that Richard Childress racing and they ran well, they've ran well in the past when they went to Bristol, uh, Kyle Busch is probably chomping at the bit. I mean, he's already in the playoffs. He has nothing to worry about. He's in the playoffs with those three wins, but the thing is he has to continue to follow up with great wins or great races one after the other and he has to continue to do this on through the regular season and then that way he can kind of float for maybe the first two playoff races if you want to say that uh, there's not enough there's not that much pressure on him but you know when it comes down to it he's going to really have to perform and I think Bristol will probably be one of the places he'll be looking forward to as one of the short tracks because um, he's loved Bristol every time he's raced at Bristol. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago when I was down there covering it for Augusta free press, he made a sweep of three races that weekend, the truck race, the Xfinity race and the cup race. And, you know, people were wondering at that time, are we ever going to be able to stop him? And I think that was the uh, race that I think he went on to win his next championship after that. So here we go. We're in this situation of where, uh, it's looking more and more like the best move ever on Kyle Busch's part, leaving Joe Gibbs racing, because it almost reminds me now of a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship in high school that just goes totally out the window. I mean, none of them, you know, neither one of them could get along. They couldn't come to an agreement on certain things. And then the new girl comes or the new guy comes into, you know, the racing picture and so forth. And it's like, 
hmm, yeah, I think I'd like to sample some success <laughs> over there with that one. <laughs> yeah. And that's what ended up happening with this. And, you know, not trying to make light of the analogy here with it, but that's exactly what happened with this. And I think it took both of them hungry for a win in Richard Childress Racing and also Kyle Busch with his attitude and everything else to push this team to where they are right now. Like a player on a stick and ball team, sometimes yeah. you, you, need, you need to find a new place to play to – Get, you get the most out of yourself. So exactly. hey, let's talk about some behind the scenes issues that were affecting all the race teams yesterday, technical issues that were making it hard for teams to communicate back to the shop and also limiting the data they could get uh, yeah. in, in a way, I guess it's kind of like they were racing old school, but uh, as much as that's how things used to be, when you're used to a certain setup, not only, you know, the way your car is set up, but also a certain amount of communication you can have, mm -hmm. the data you can see, decisions are made based on that data, and then all of a sudden it's either gone or just unreliable. That had to be tough for those teams yesterday. Yeah, it was. And, I mean, uh, I think Fox came out and said yesterday or in a statement, they made the comment and said, you know, it was nothing on their end. There was nothing. It just happened to be some kind of failure or something like that. And if you're not familiar with the way that some of these teams are set up now, uh, a lot of this, I think, got started even more when the pandemic hit. And that was these teams have to have some kind of dedicated internet line or at least dedicated, you know, service, fiber, line, whatever it may be. And they have to have something back to the shop. And they've got people, even though you think the whole team is out there on the race day and so forth, and they're changing tires, putting the gas in, working on the engine and so forth, you have people back at the shop who are watching telemetry as it's coming through. It's almost like Mission Control watching an Apollo launch or something of that nature. And that's what they're doing. They're watching, they're seeing trends, they're looking at things on the engines and so forth. And when these things go down, you're in trouble. I mean, if you've relied on this thing, it's sort of like when the power goes out and here we are and we we live in a society now where we can just pull up our phone, we can just start looking at stuff and see what's going on. It didn't happen yesterday. That was the, you know, the spotty kind of service or whatever they had yesterday. And uh, yeah, I put a lot of them back in the way that the old school, the way that things were done back in the old days, which you know, I kind of think they, they kind of need to get back to that a little bit more because that was the more of the fun part of racing to me. I, I mean, you didn't have the 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you didn't have the teams sitting back in the shop looking at telemetry. They were doing everything right there. And I think of Ernie Irvin's first victory at Daytona, and it was done on a calculator and on scrap paper by Tim Morgan in the pits to calculate how much gas he was going to have to finish the race. You know, this now is all on telemetry. They may say, yeah, from the looks of it, he's got enough gas and so forth, but that's not necessarily the case. So, uh, yeah, it caused some problems for him yesterday. It was a lot of problems combined with the weather and everything else that was going on. Uh, it caused a lot of problems. One other sort of off track, a uh, little tidbit, um, uh, the right front tire changer for Eric Jones, Thomas Hatcher was injured when he got tangled with another crew member. Uh, during a pit stop, um, the, the last I saw, uh, he was taken by ambulance to the hospital and was awake and alert. Any update on his status? Well, he was pretty much treated. They checked him out. And I think he was released. And so, uh, he's, he's doing okay. And so forth. That was one of those little mishaps that happened and communications on pit road and the way things were going, you just got to be prepared for that sort of thing. And it can happen at any time. I mean, you can be there and it's like somebody was talking to me the other day. We were talking about, um, I think somebody was asking me about credentials and going to a race and so forth, you know, and I'm going to say this, it's, it's sort of like one of these things. If you're a race team, you are taking your life into your own hands when you're in the pits. Okay. The same thing for us is we're covering it when we're in the turns or if we're outside the media center and so forth, you know, if a, you know, one of those little rubber pebbles, you know, that they've got that comes off the tires and everything. If it hits me smack in the forehead and knocks me backwards or it embeds into my head like something you'd see on Dr. Pimple Popper, yeah. then, you know, it's my chance. I'm taking that chance of covering that race. Uh, you know, some of these tracks are so crazy about asking for workman's compensation. Do you have workman's compensation on this and so forth? These guys, this is a part of their life. And, you know, if it's chasing tires down, you know, getting knocked down, whatever the case may be, they're doing it because they love it. They're doing it because they're dedicated to that team. And 
it's like I was trying to explain to the person uh, the other day and telling them about it. I said, it's the same thing with me. When I'm out there at the track, you know, I know that I, if I'm standing at a wall and somebody loses control of the car and it hits that wall and I'm standing there, well, now it's knowing you folks, it could have been that, or it could be something crushing your leg before it's over with. I enjoy it that much to take that chance to be able to go, but I also need to use the Boy Scout motto, so to speak be prepared, be prepared for about anything that could possibly happen. And, you know, this is, this is very fast paced. They're turning what a uh, lap time or not lap times, but pit times sometimes in the neighborhood of around 10 seconds. And that's shaved off considerably from what it used to be. I mean, some teams was 15, 16, 17 seconds. And now we consider that slow 10 seconds is considered super fast, but who's to say in two more years, it may be eight seconds, seven seconds on a pit stop, you know, uh, things happen in a short span of time. They're looking for every hundredth they can find, every thousandth they can find. Uh, yep. Some of those races are that close. The, the places can be that close. So the top five, uh, Denny Hamlin was second, Joey Logano third, Kyle Lar uh, let's see, Martin Truex Jr. Oh, yeah, Kyle Larson fourth, Martin Truex Jr. fifth. I'll me I mentioned that to then bring in that Corey LaJoy was 21st uh, in Chase Elliott's car. Elliot was suspended last week for the uh, the dust up with uh, Denny Hamlin, um, and I, and I bring that up to say I, I was surprised, Rod. Uh, a lot of comments on our um, podcast from last week just were, were all we did was talk about right. the Chase Elliot Denny Hamlin situation, uh, and and you know I, I I was getting ready to call this like the Chase Elliot haters out there. I think we found the little pocket of those people. Lots of comments from people saying that Chase Elliott should have been suspended longer. He should be suspended for the whole season. Now, I say I, I'm surprised to see this. I, I thought Chase Elliott was one of the most popular, if not maybe the most popular driver out there. Did we just happen to find the few relative few people who don't like him? Or is there a bigger thought out there that Elliott was really very much in the wrong last week? I think it was a lot of people just thought he was pretty much in the wrong last week. Uh, you know, and then I, I've got to say this. Uh, Denny Hamlin's kind of Denny Hamlin's kind of like one of these sand fleas when you go to the beach and those sand fleas bite at your legs and they bite you before you realize it. And then it's like, it's too late to go and swat at them because they've already bit and they've taken off. Um, he's that quick. He's that quick when he goes and he makes this assertion. And I know that I got into a little bit of a discussion with someone and I, I made the comment. It was kind of a off the wall kind of comment of, well, you know, when did, uh, when did Denny Hamlin go and become judge, jury, and executioner for this whole thing? And also when is he going to be making his bid for his, um, unfriendly or his takeover of NASCAR, because that's the way it seems. And it seems like he's getting all the information from NASCAR and the guy fired back at me. And he told me, he says, we well, you know he's the head of the driver's union. Well, you know, and they don't really have a union per se, but it's the driver's group that he's the head of. And I'm like, I don't care if he's the president of the United States, you know, <laughs> still, you just don't keep up with this stuff. And it's almost like everybody in one way, and I'm, I'm saying this, I may get in trouble for it, but it seems like everybody that goes into the, uh, into the pits or goes into the pit area has to bow and kneel to Denny Hamlin. And I just don't think that's right. And Denny Hamlin, you know, if, if he had won a championship or two, if he had won that or something, and he, you know, persistent or, and consistent as uh, a Dale Earnhardt, somebody like that, then I would listen to him, but he's not won anything. He's not won anything that I can really speak of that I can, you know, he's, he's won some great races before he's won Daytona and things like that, but it doesn't make him the expert. Now, as for, as for Chase Elliott, on the other hand, I think Chase Elliott just really reached too far when he said, ah, when you hit the wall and stuff, these cars, they just don't, they just don't handle right after that. Uh, I thought that was a lame excuse, especially coming from, from Chase Elliott. And then, yes, I have to say after the Denny Hamlin telemetry, the information that they had from NASCAR that he shared, it shows clearly that the car went, it steered, it went into that direction and you had to have somebody steer it. And they haven't come up with these self-driving race cars yet. And so Chase Elliott bound to have done it. And uh, I think he knows he made a mistake and he's kind of stayed quiet about it since then. And um, I just don't know what, you know, how this is going to play out. I don't think he's going to get the most popular driver award uh, this year, unless something 
royally takes place. You know, we might be looking at Kyle Bush as, as the most popular driver in 2023. I'm, I'm serious. This is the, the world is changing. It's about the, the axis is shifting on the planet. We may be turning upside down before it's over with. It's already started in NASCAR. Red is blue. Blue is green. Cats love dogs. It's what's going on in this world. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Now my cats love my dogs, but my dogs don't love my cats. I don't know why that's the problem, but that's another example for another thing to discuss one day. Well, so. cats just don't care. So no, um, they don't. That, that counts as love, I guess. <laughs> Um, the race this coming weekend is in Sonoma, the road course as another road course race. Daniel Suarez won last year. He that win was was significant. He was the first Mexican born driver to win a cup series race when he won that one last year. Um, what can we look forward to this weekend in Sonoma? Well, I think this is going to be pivotal for your teams like Trackhouse Racing because they're in desperate need of a win right now. Last year, Ross Chastain had some wins. Uh, they were talking about how popular and how great this team was. Then you had Daniel Suarez went at Sonoma and he pulled off a great race right there and won that. Um, now they've just kind of been floating. They've not been doing anything else. They've not had good performances. Um, Daniel Suarez has not done that well uh, so far on the season uh, in and out of the top 10. And then we find him somewhere about, you know, maybe top 20, top 25 or something, finishing the race before he's knocked out or something of that nature. Um, I think track house has to have a good race this coming weekend. Um, no doubt about it. Um, Chastain or Daniel Suarez one has to have a really good race. Um, I think for chase Elliott, he'll be eligible to be back on the, uh, the circuit this week. Uh, he serves that one race suspension this past weekend from St. Louis. Um, look for him to be, you know, some, somebody to at least, perk up and pay attention to during the course of this race out in Sonoma uh, this coming weekend. And also can't rule out Kyle Busch at this point, Kyle Busch, they've got some momentum now. And, you know, it's, it's like driving a, a track, uh, driving a short, uh, short car program and having a short car, uh, short track car uh, on the road course. So we'll see how they do this weekend, but uh, you know, I'm not going to count out a Joey Logano and I'm not going to count out a uh, Ryan Blaney out of this because some of these guys really enjoy the road courses uh, as opposed to some of the uh, old veterans that uh, used to race on them. And, you know, a lot of them were like of the attitude, let's just go and take a plow and just plow the whole thing up and make it into a super speedway. That's the way they felt about road courses. So we're back to the thing of where you've got the young drivers who really enjoy the road courses. I've always liked the road courses. I thought they were weird at first, only going something like 90 laps. But, uh, you know, they're 90 long laps or what they are. So uh, out in California, it will be a different story. It's not going to be like it was at the uh, Circuit of the Americas or like it would be up in New York if they were racing up there at Watkins Glen. Sonoma is a racetrack in and of itself, all by itself is what it is. And so we've got a number of teams that could make an impact, I think, on the track this coming weekend at Sonoma. We might even have a first-time winner at least, I think coming from somewhere we may see an aj allmendinger come out of that too because he's racing full-time does really well on the road courses he knocks about everybody out of the way in order to get to the front and he'll race you all over the track to hold that position i wouldn't rule out something uh, coming from uh, them in college racing this coming weekend that's 3 30 on sunday it's early for those folks out there the teams have to be out there on the track getting ready to start at 12 30 pacific time and uh, it's the last race of the Fox part of the TV schedule. And then we have a week off. We actually have a weekend off before the series goes back uh, to Nashville uh, on NBC. NBC starting its broadcast schedule on June 25th. So we'll have a little bit of a break in between, a little bit of a chance to reassess where things stand. Rod, as always, thank you for your time and your insight. I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks.